Hello kids. Today we're going to study about a prophet named Jonah. And I'm here at Lake Whitney where I live so that I could give more of a real effect as to what we were doing. We have studied about several prophets like Samuel and Elisha and Elijah, seeing how God used them to reveal his plans and his will to the people. The prophet had God's approval, and when he spoke, he was to be obeyed just as if God were speaking himself. What if a prophet spoke and it came true? They were then considered a true prophet. These prophets convicted the people of the sins that they were committing and urged them to repent, giving warnings of what would happen if they didn't. They had a responsibility to counsel kings and to correct them when they were not obeying God's laws. They reminded God's people of what God had done for them in the past and how their ancestors had not listened. They proclaimed God's purpose for Israel and pointed forward towards the Messiah and his coming kingdom. Sometimes their warnings and prophecies were heeded and sometimes they were not. Some prophets recorded all the happenings of their lifetimes, and some we only hear about briefly. We have studied about Elijah, who performed miracles and defeated 400 prophets of Baal, and then ran off from a queen who threatened his life. He didn't trust that God was great enough to take care of him after he had already performed miracles in front of him. But even in his cowardly ways, God still loved him and didn't let him die, but took him up to heaven and left Elijah, his intern, to take over his job. Elisha did twice as many miracles as Elijah and continued teaching others to be prophets as well. We have studied Hosea, who was obedient when God told him to go marry a prostitute and use that marriage as a living example to show Israel how unfaithful they had been to him and how forgiving he would be if they asked for forgiveness. Most prophets spoke to their own nations, but some like Obadiah, Nahum, and Jonah were called to speak to other nations that were Gentiles. Hosea and Jonah are the only two prophets who spoke to the northern kingdom, and God saw fit for both of them to have their very own books in the Bible. The book of Jonah is short. It's only four chapters, and I've asked y'all to read it ahead of time so you would know what was going on. It is so packed full of adventure and examples of how we should respond when God calls us to move, how he wants us to respond to others, and how he still loves us even when we mess up. Jonah was called a reluctant prophet because he did not want to go where God wanted him to go or do what God wanted him to do. According to Jewish tradition, he was the son of the widow Zarephath, whom Elijah had raised from the dead, and he attended Elisha's school for the prophets. He came from a town near Nazareth called Gath Hepper, and the people living there were considered to be Galileans. In Jesus' day, the Pharisees said, no prophet comes from Galilee, but Jonah was indeed a Galilean, and he was a prophet, but he was not remembered for his prophetic lessons that he taught in Israel. He did, however, prophesy to Jeroboam II that the lands that had been taken from northern Israel would be restored, and this indeed did come to pass. In the book of 2 Kings, it says that Jeroboam recovered the territories of Israel just as the Lord had promised through Jonah, the prophet from gath Hepper. During Jeroboam II's reign, the northern kingdom had a physical sense of peace and prosperity, but spiritually they were not doing very well because Jeroboam II and the people were still worshiping idols. God had sent his prophets to warn them to repent and stop worshiping idols, but they would not listen. God used Jonah to try a different approach to get the northern kingdom's attention. He called Jonah to go to the Assyrians, their arch enemy, the ones that had come against them so many times and preach his message of repentance to them and tell them of the coming judgment if they didn't stop worshiping idols and stop the cruel ways that they treated people when they conquered them. Jonah didn't want to go at first 
but after a very fishy experience, Jonah surrendered. So let's hear about that fishy experience. The town that God told Jonah to go to was Nineveh. It was the capital of the Assyrians. It was the largest city in the world at that time. And its walls were a hundred feet high and it had an inner wall and an outer wall. And that inner wall was so wide, four chariots could ride side by side at the same time. It was 60 miles all the way around and it would take three days to walk through it. Nineveh was founded by Nimrod. You might remember him. He was the man who created the Tower of Babel. He was the great, great grandson of Noah who God told to build an ark to save his family from the flood. That was another watery story of salvation. Nineveh means fish, and this city worshiped fish gods. They also worshiped Asher and the war goddess Ishtar. But the fish god that they worshiped was called Dagon. Do you remember when we studied about Dagon? He was a half man and half fish god that the, the Canaanites worshiped. Several months ago when we studied how the Ark of the Covenant was stolen, it was placed in Dagon's temple as an offering to Dagon. And the Ark of the Covenant was so powerful with God's presence, it kept making Dagon's statue fall on its face. And the last time it made his hands fall off and his head fall off. Jonah didn't believe that they deserved God's grace, and he knew if God was giving them a warning, he would also give them an opportunity to repent. Jonah felt superior to them as he was a prophet, and he was part of the community of God's chosen people, and he didn't believe that anyone else had the right to be grafted into their nation. The Assyrians were very cruel people. They would cut off body parts of those they conquered just for sport. They would cut off their fingers and cut off their tongues and gouge out their eyes. They were very cruel. Centuries later, God brought Jesus to open the doorway for all Gentiles to be grafted into the family of God. But God had given Jonah this missionary assignment to give the Assyrians a chance to repent of their ways and accept him, but Jonah did not want to go. This is the only recorded time a prophet of God refused to obey God's command. Instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah got on a boat heading in the opposite direction, going towards a town called Tarshish. This boat was manned by the best sailors in those ancient times, and they were called the Phoenicians. When Jonah got on this boat, a terrible storm came up, and the Phoenicians knew it was not an ordinary storm. The Phoenicians were very responsible for everything that they transported, and they were known for getting their cargoes delivered safe and on time. But to save themselves and the ship, they started tossing everything they possibly could overboard to lighten the load of the ship so they would not capsize. The ship's captain realized that Jonah was not on the top deck, and he started looking for him to make sure he had not been swept aside with the crashing waves. He found him in the hull of the ship, fast asleep. The captain asked him how he could be asleep in such a storm and told him to get up and pray to his God and ask for help, because maybe his God would help them. Jonah knew the storm was created by his God who was unhappy with him for not obeying him, but he didn't tell the truth until he was caught red-handed. The Phoenicians had already decided that someone on board had really must have angered their God, and they cast lots to see who the guilty person was. God made Jonah's lot to show that he was indeed the guilty person, and Jonah had to confess. They asked him why this storm had come upon them, and he had to tell them how he had rebelled against his God, and his God was angry with him. He first identified himself as a Hebrew, and then he started quoting scripture to these pagan sailors to show them his God was the one who created the heavens, the sea, and the dry land, and their fish gods that they were serving had nothing to do with creation. As he shared God's message of repentance and forgiveness, the Phoenicians couldn't understand why Jonah would rebel against such a good God. The whole ship was about to break apart, and the storm was getting worse. They knew Jonah's disobedience had endangered the whole crew, and they asked Jonah what he thought they should do. Jonah didn't want to face God, and so he told them to throw him overboard and that the storm would stop. 
Jonah could have told them to take him back to Tarshish, but he didn't want to face God. These Phoenician men cared more about one man than Jonah did about a whole nation, and they didn't want to throw Jonah overboard. So they tried desperately to row to the shore, but the waves were too strong and they failed. They prayed to Jonah's God, asking why, what they should do, as they did not want to perish, but they also didn't want to throw a man overboard and have innocent blood on his hands. So God was using Jonas's weakness to turn the hearts of these men. God can use our weaknesses as well if we will just surrender to him and ask him to strengthen us and use our weaknesses for his glory. Remember, when we are weak, he is strong and God loves all the children of the world. The men indeed threw him overboard and immediately the storm stopped and they knew it truly was Jonah who had angered his God. The Phoenicians were so grateful the storm had stopped and their lives were saved, they started praying to Jonah's God and offering up sacrifices to him, and they vowed to worship him only. These men were now convinced that Jonah's God was much more powerful than their gods. God had used Jonah's disobedience to get the Phoenicians to turn their hearts to him. He has an amazing way of making good out of everything. God did not want Jonah thrown overboard just so he could drown. He just wanted to get him to a place where he would surrender to him. Scripture tells us that God prepared a big fish to be waiting right there in the water where Jonah was thrown in, and that fish swallowed him whole. Some people say this is just a made-up story, but we know that it's true because Jesus used this experience of Jonah and compared it to himself and it's recorded in Matthew 12, 38 through 41, and in Luke 11, 29 through 32. In these verses, the Pharisees were pressuring Jesus to give them a miraculous sign. They wanted something spectacular. He gave them a sign, all right, but it was a sign from Scripture. He told them they were an unfaithful and evil generation, just craving for a sign. But no sign was going to be given to them except the sign of Jonah the prophet. They didn't really understand what he was talking about. But just as Jonah was swallowed up by a fish and was three days and three nights in its belly, Jesus himself would be swallowed up by the earth with death for three days and would emerge living just like Jonah. And you remember, this is when he was crucified and put in the tomb for three days. And we're fixing to celebrate Resurrection Sunday that helps us have a big celebration for when Jesus came out of the tomb and then was resurrected. And our celebrations are going to be in our own homes while we are confined and sheltered in. But we still can take communion, have some kind of bread and some kind of drink, and purpose in our hearts that it is a reminder to us that Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and three days later he rose again, showing us that we too are going to be resurrected back to life once we are put in the grave. So Jesus also told them that the men of Nineveh were going to stand up with their generation at the end of the judgment. And they were going to condemn the Pharisees because the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. But someone even greater than Jonah was standing right before the Pharisees, and they were not repenting. In fact, they killed Jesus. In Luke, Jesus says that Jonah was a sign to the Ninevites, and he himself was a sign to the Pharisees. Jesus would not have cited a story like this to compare it with his glorious resurrection or prophesy how the people of Nineveh would shame the Pharisees if it wasn't true. So we know it actually happened, despite so many times people have tried to prove that it didn't. The Christians, after Jesus was resurrected, used the sign of the fish as a safe way to see if it was okay to talk to a stranger they met about Jesus. A Christian meeting a stranger would draw the top part of a fish in the sand with his toe. And if the stranger was safe and also a Christian, they would draw the bottom half of the fish, completing the fish. And that person would know it was safe to talk to them about Jesus. 
because you see, this was during a time that the Romans were crucifying Christians because they were preaching about Jesus and spreading his gospel. And they needed to make sure it was safe to talk to someone so that they wouldn't get killed. It was nothing for the God of the universe to orchestrate that big old fish to be there just in the right place at just the right time to swallow him whole and save him from drowning. The fish was obeying God, even if Jonah was not. God didn't want to kill Jonah. He just wanted him to obey him and go to Nineveh. The purpose of God's judgment or correction is always for saving, not revenge. He is always ready to show compassion when someone seeks him. And God knows what it will take to get them to follow in the footsteps he wants them to walk in. He knew Jonah needed to be in the belly of that fish for three days and three nights so that he could have time to change his mind about obeying him and going to Nineveh. Have you ever been put in a timeout after doing something wrong? And after you were there for a while, you decided it really wasn't where you wanted to be and you changed your mind about disobeying? The belly of this fish, I'm sure, was not a very pleasant place for Jonah to be either. But it was stinky and it was hot. There were a lot of dead fish and seaweed wrapped around his head. And there were acids, digestive juices in the fish's belly that was supposed to dissolve its food. And those acids would actually burn Jonah's skin and bleach his skin out white and turn his clothes white too. Just like bleach would burn your skin and bleach your clothes out white. You may wonder why Jonah didn't get chewed up as he was going through that fish's mouth. But I want to tell you, I'm sure that God told that fish not to hurt Jonah. But we also know with marine biology, there are great white sharks in the Mediterranean Sea that are big enough to swallow a human. They don't chew their food. They swallow it whole. So the fish could have actually swallowed Jonah without harming him. And this great white shark's digestive system is so slow, a person could actually be in their stomach for three days and not be killed. There have been other people that have been swallowed by a whale and then gotten out alive. So we know that this is true because it is in our Bible. You might also wonder how he could have breathed in the belly of that fish. But remember, this was a very big fish. There are also a whale called a sperm whale that could have taken him in and swallowed him whole. But these kind of whales, the sperm whales, don't live in the Mediterranean Sea. But you know, I bet God could have called a sperm whale from halfway around the world to come and serve him with Jonah. But it really doesn't matter what type of fish it was or where it came from. What really matters is that God provided a way for Jonah to live and not die when he was thrown overboard. God says in his word to be still and know that he is God. That's Psalms 46.10. Jonah knew scripture because he was a prophet of God and he had studied in Elisha's prophet school. And he prayed in the belly of that fish and he quoted 18 different scriptures from the book of Psalms. He started his prayer saying that when he called out in distress, the Lord answered him. He said he cried out from the depths of Sheol, which is another name for hell. And he says again, the Lord heard his voice. He said that the Lord had him thrown into the deep heart of the sea with the waves swallowing him because of his disobedience. Yet, he still asked the Lord for help. He knew that the Lord had made a promise to his people that if they were ever in distress, they could look towards Jerusalem. And even if they were not near Jerusalem, they could cry out to him and he would hear their cry. God had heard his cry, even though he didn't know which way Jerusalem was because he was in the belly of that whale. He had no point of reference of land or sun or moon to gauge the east from the west or the north from the south. But in his heart, he purposed to be praying towards Jerusalem as God had told them to do. It's important that we purpose in our hearts to seek God, even if we don't know exactly where he is. He knows where we are at all time. And Jonah knew that this was the only way out of the belly of that fish, to cry out for God and ask for his help. How many times do we wait 
to pray until we, like Jonah, are in a situation that we cannot control. Inside the belly of that fish, he was covered with seaweed, and as the whale moved, he was tossed around. And when the whale went to the bottom of the sea, you know that Jonah would have felt the pressure change, and he didn't know if he would survive or not. But it says, as he was fainting away, he remembered the Lord, and he continued praying, promising that he would be faithful from then on. He asked the Lord to deliver him, and he did. Sometimes people make promises to God when they are in stressful situations, but then they go back on their promises when they're no longer needing God and are no longer in a distressful situation. This is not good. When we promise God something, we need to follow through. Jonah did follow through with his promises of going to Nineveh, and it says that he offered up praises and sacrifices to God when all of it was over. After the third day, God commanded the fish to vomit Jonah up on the shores of Joppa. God was giving Jonah a second chance to serve him and go to Nineveh. The whale have had to have bleached, had to beach itself on the shore to be able to vomit Jonah up on dry land. Scripture tells us that he was vomited up on dry land. Whales, sharks, whatever the fish is, they don't normally beach themselves. But God ordered this fish to beach itself and use that beaching to accomplish his will and get Jonah safely put out on the shore. It is very important to God for us to obey him. And it is very important to God for Jonah to go to Nineveh so that he could preach to that city and give them an opportunity to repent and be forgiven. Can you imagine being a fisherman on a shoreline just like this right here, fishing? Or maybe out in a boat. I hear a boat coming right now. And you see a fish that beaches itself and vomits up a live human being on the sand. What would you think was going on? Why would a human being be in a fish's belly, much less be vomited up and then wriggling around in a big blob of vomit trying to stand up after it had just been vomited up by a huge fish, who now, by this time, was probably wiggling around to get back in the sea. You would run and tell everyone you knew what had happened, and then that person would run and tell everyone they knew, and it wouldn't be long before all this news would reach Nineveh. The Phoenician sailors also were spreading the tale of Jonah when their boats would arrive at from one port to the other port. And as they took their cargo inland, everyone would hear the story and pass it on. I'm sure everyone was looking for a man that had his skin and his clothes bleached white named Jonah, who had been thrown off a Phoenician ship because he had disobeyed his God, caused a horrible storm, and then had been thrown overboard, but he didn't drown because he was swallowed up by a great big fish. They would know that his God told him to, to go to Nineveh with a message that in 40 days they would be destroyed if they didn't repent of their sins of idolatry and their desire to cruelly conquer and torture other nations. This would be a story people would hear about and it would open up people's hearts and minds and give them ears to be able to hear God if they would just ask him for help. God was using this story of Jonah to reach a lot of people, not just Nineveh. He's using it to reach us in our hearts right now. Jonah was going to Nineveh, but he still hadn't changed his mind about Nineveh not deserving God's mercy. God had stopped Nineveh from its horrible raiding parties by sending a plague, and then there was an eclipse of the sun that they didn't understand, and then another plague. Just like we are going through the coronavirus thing right now, we don't understand. We're all looking for an answer. So were these people from Nineveh. And they decided that the gods were unhappy with them and were causing these events to happen. And it had shook Nineveh to the core. And then the story of Jonah came about the boat and the fish. And it further opened the door of their hearts to the message that Jonah would bring about how they could be saved by his God. Jonah's walk to Nineveh from Joppa was long, but it wasn't as hard as the walk through Nineveh because he was going to have to proclaim the judgment of God for three whole days. Remember, that's how long it took to walk across Nineveh. And you know, 
He proclaimed that God would destroy Nineveh in 40 days, but he didn't tell them that God would forgive them if they repented. So he didn't tell the whole story. How many times have your parents told you to go tell your brother or your sister something and you only told them part of it because you knew the rest of it might get them into trouble and you wanted to see them get into trouble? But to Jonah's astonishment, the people started repenting immediately when he was walking through, including their king of Nineveh. And he ordered the whole nation to fast and put on itchy sackcloth and search their hearts and turn from their evil, idolatrous ways in the hopes that maybe the God of Jonah would turn away his wrath, forgive them, and not destroy them. Because remember, Jonah wasn't telling them that he would forgive them if they repented. But this was in their hearts. They wanted to live. This king also made even the animals wear this itchy sackcloth to make sure all the sins were covered. But the people from um, Nineveh a lot of times used their animals in their ritual practices to their gods. So that was normal for them. God saw what they were doing and he forgave them and did not destroy them. We don't know how long this whole process took. We know it was three days that he went through Nineveh. But with this changed heart attitude, Assyria did not attack Israel again for many years. And that's how King Jeroboam II had years of peace because the Assyrians weren't attacking him, just like Jonah had prophesied before. But Jeroboam II and all the people there never did repent of their idolatry. God has sent his many, many prophets to speak to them and tell them that they needed to stop worshiping idols and repent and serve only him. But they never did it. But now a pagan city that didn't even know about God only had to be spoken to one time by one prophet and the whole nation repented. This was a miracle. God was using the repentance of Nineveh to shame Israel into doing what was right. But Israel was very stiff-necked and very stubborn. You know, it pleases God when we surrender to his word. God's mercy extends to all who repent and believe. We should ask God every day to show us if there's anything in our lives that we're doing wrong and give us the strength to stop, repent, and receive his forgiveness so that we can step back into his blessings. Jonah had wanted God to destroy his enemies, not save them. He didn't believe that he would ever be taken seriously again as a prophet because his prophecy about the destruction of Nineveh didn't happen. He knew that false prophets were often stoned. That's what Mosaic law said was supposed to happen. He was afraid of being stoned. And he was also so angry that Nineveh had repented and now was in God's graces, he just couldn't stand it. He was more concerned with his own life and his own reputation than he was about the salvation of a whole nation. Do we want things to happen in our lives for our glory or for God's glory? That's something you need to pray about. Let God show you what you are actually doing. Jonah was thinking of his own glory. He wasn't thinking about Nineveh. He was thinking about his own heart and how it was hurting. And his heart was becoming more and more hardened the more he thought about it. And he complained to the Lord saying that he knew God was going to forgive them from the beginning if they repented. Because he knew God was gracious, slow to anger, and abundant in loving kindness. And he had fled to the boat heading towards Tarshish, the opposite direction of Nineveh, so that he wouldn't look bad. He was so frustrated that he asked God to go ahead and kill him right then if what he had prophesied was going to happen wasn't going to happen because he did not want to face the Ninevites or the Israelites. He was happy when he was saved from the fish, but he wasn't happy when the Ninevites were saved from their sins. Are you happy when something good happens to you, but when something good happens to somebody else, do you still rejoice? God says he wants us to rejoice when good things happen to other people. That pleases God. God asked Jonah if it was right for him to be angry at this, and Jonah didn't answer. How many times has your parents asked you, you think you did right, and you just sat there and didn't say nothing? 
It was because in your heart, you really thought that you did have a right, but you know that the real answer was no. So Jonah went out east of the city and he made a shelter for himself on top of a high hill so he could sit there and wait and see if maybe God would change his mind. I'm sure he was praying that God was gonna change his mind. You know, even though Jonah was still in his disobedience, God still had compassion on him. And he made a plant with large leaves to grow supernaturally fast to shelter his head from the sun. And Jonah was very grateful as it eased his discomfort. It's really hot where I am right now and the sun is beacon down on my head the same way. But if you can imagine a great big leaf coming up and sheltering my head, making shadow, then I wouldn't be in the sun. And that's what God had caused to happen for Jonah because he loved him. God was continuing to be kind and patient with Jonah, meeting his needs to show him how much he cared. It was still important for, to God for Jonah to, to go to Nineveh and step out of his anger, but Jonah wasn't budging. And because he wasn't, during the night, God caused a worm to chew through the stem of the plant that had been sheltering him, and it withered and died. And God made an east wind to blow so hot of air towards him, it was unbearable. And the sun to beat down even hotter on him. And Jonah was so uncomfortable, he begged God to take his life once again, saying that death would be better than living like that. You know, God was still trying to get through to Jonah. And God asked him if he thought he was right to be angry at the plant. Jonah said he had every right to be angry at the plant, as it no longer was sheltering him from the heat and the wind and the sun, and he was angry enough, he just wanted to die. And God replied, you know, you liked that plant when it sheltered you and was doing what you wanted it to do. But when it no longer served you, you become angry. Yet you didn't do anything to plant this plant or cause it to grow. You only received the benefit from it. And then God asked him, why he thought that compassion should not be given to a nation that had at least 120,000 children who didn't even know their right hand from their left they were so young and all the animals who had not sinned. He asked Jonah, why shouldn't I have compassion on them? You know, there had to have been at least 600,000 people total in Nineveh because God just named the ones that were children, which was 120,000. Maybe there were more. It was probably near a half a million people in Nineveh at that time in spiritual darkness. But God's love for the people of Nineveh, who he created, he knew that they were in spiritual darkness and his love for them desired for them to be repenting and stepping into the light that he had for them. And it was a very different kind of love than the kind of love Jonah had for the plant. Jonah loved the plant only when it served him, but God loved the people even when they didn't serve him. And he had compassion for them even in their disobedience of worshiping idols and being cruel to other nations. It's oftentimes more convenient for us to be concerned about our own physical interest than someone else's spiritual well-being. It's easier for us to feel sorry for ourselves than it is for us to feel sorry for someone else's problems. That's the world's way, but it's not God's way. He wants us to do unto others as we want them to do unto us. Jonah had a self-serving heart and only showed compassion when his needs were being met. But God had a people-serving heart, which as a prophet of God, Jonah should have had also. Despite this, Jonah had the courage to write his own story down, weaknesses and all, and he laid them out there for us to be able to read and learn from. Maybe finally Jonah got what, try, what God was trying to get through to him, and maybe he understood, and the only way he could redeem himself was to write it down so that maybe we wouldn't make the same mistakes that he did. So he confessed his sin of being angry and rebellious in a way that was sharing it with us to show us how God still answered his prayer. God also answered the Phoenicians' prayers and the people of Nineveh's prayers, and he will answer our prayers as well if we call out to him. 
He hears those that call upon his name if they repent and respond in obedience to him. We might think our in-home shelter is too uncomfortable for us right now. And maybe we're doing a lot of complaining like Jonah did. God had a, has a plan in what's happening right now that we can't see yet. But in time, he will reveal his plan to us just like he revealed it to Jonah. And it will be a good plan. We see the end of Jonah's story. And so it's a lot easier for us to trust that God had a good plan. I want to encourage you to start now asking God to show you the good that he's going to be bringing out of all of this and to keep your mindset on trusting God instead of complaining about the situation that you're in. It develops your faith when you trust God even though you don't like your situation and cannot understand the purpose or the outcome. You have a choice. You can run to God or run away from him like Jonah. He knows where you are, where you are, and he knows what you need to go through to get you to the place where you can serve him the best. And he knows that this will make you the happiest. That's why the angels are so happy. They're always doing what God tells them to do. Maybe you need to learn to start obeying your parents better. Or maybe you need to focus on your schoolwork more. Or maybe you learn how to be kinder to your siblings and other people. Maybe kinder to your parents by going through this situation. Why don't you go ahead and learn what you need to learn and then we can all move out. I just wanna pray just for a minute. Father, I thank you so much that you have brought such a beautiful day here at the lake that I can share this story of Jonah with the children. I thank you for the story of Jonah. I thank you how Jesus used Jonah's story to prove that it was true. I thank you that you care about us just like you cared about Jonah and just like you cared about the people of Nineveh. Show us the places in our heart that we need to change, God, and help us ask you to give us the courage, to give us the strength to do it. These things I pray in Jesus' name. And I say thank you, Father, for sending Jesus. Thank you that you raised him up for the dead. And thank you that you're going to do the same for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, by the way, this is the lake. It's very calm today. I don't see any fishes jumping up and swallowing me whole. And I'm grateful for that. <laughs>